All right, Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 21. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. We know that this is given in context as a, as a couplet. We've had language given to the children, those that are um, in the subordinate role, the two children, obey your parents in all things. Why? For this is well pleasing unto the Lord. All right, so that's the address to the children. We looked at that last week. And so fathers in particular um, are called out, but applies to parents in general. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. All right, children, last night we talked about when we're obeying, there's some do's and there's some, and there's some don'ts. So for the fathers, is this, is this given as a do or a don't? A don't, right? Don't provoke your children to anger. Why? Lest they be discouraged. Alright, what's it mean to provoke? Um, you notice that in italics is to anger. So that word provoke, the Greek word has the expression of provoke to anger all tied up in one word. And it literally means to stir to anger. Y'all ever been accused of stirring the pot? Me too. <laughs> to stir to anger, to excite to anger, to irritate to anger. Um, right? Y'all ever done that? As parents? Yep, me too. <laughs> What's the opposite of that? How about to, to be quiet, to be still, to make peace, to unite together versus... Stirring up strife, stirring up division, stirring up divi uh, contention, right? What's the reason the fathers who said, don't do this? What does it say? Lest your children be discouraged. Well, discouraged literally means without heart or without spirit. To make them dispirited, despondent, disturbed in the mind. Literally, to, to lose courage. You ever been disappointed, or let's not disappointed, but let, let's say that discouraged that you just felt like you could not please your parent? Why even try? Doesn't really care anyway. Doesn't love me. All right. That's a really bad spot as a child to be in. As fathers, it's our responsibility to prevent that. Because often it's our conduct that has led to that situation where our love is in question and we make it difficult to please. Okay? So, a child is not a horse. Right? Wild colt, what do you have to do with that? Break it! Right? You've got to break his spirit. Why? Because otherwise he won't do what he's told, but... A wild colt is meant to be given orders for the rest of his life. He is eternally to be subservient to that master. Right? That's, that's the, the goal. Is you break the horse's spirit and then he obeys you for the rest of his life. Your children are not colts. Right? They are to be trained so that they can restrain themselves in adulthood. Right? The obedience that we have when they're children is for a purpose to protect them, guide them, lead them, but ultimately, it's not for them to be subservient to me their whole life. It's to prepare them to be adults, to be functional, effective, and for us, more importantly, to be godly men and women. Right? So the goal is not to break their spirit, but is to train so that they are prepared to restrain themselves. Right? Self-discipline. Right? Key word in that is self. Right? Beyond when my children are outside of the home, they are responsible for constraining themselves. It's no longer my role. I can give them advice. I can try and point out, say, hey, that's probably not a good idea. But they have to have the skills and the tools prepared in order to step into that role. All right? So, what is our vision as parents, as fathers? Um, you know, the 
I didn't look it up, but you know, where there is no vision, the people perish. Right? You want to go find that um, in Scripture. All right. So, what is your vision for your children? All right. And this is more important to us than it is to the world. The world's vision is easy. I want my children to be happy. I want them to be healthy and preferably wealthy. All right. Our vision is much more important, and it's not created by us. All right? So go to Ephesians chapter 6. This is kind of the companion verse for Colossians. Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to read um, verses 1 through 4, since it's all tied together. What does it start with? It starts with children. Obey your parents in the Lord. Why? For this is right. right. Okay. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. Right? We've got so we talked about last week about the obedience. When you're not an adult yet, you must obey mama and daddy, right? When you're an adult, you still have to what? Honor them. Hold them in respect and dignity and in their old age, care for them, right? Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Verse four. And ye Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. All right. This provoking is a different word. This provoking um, has the idea of to anger alongside. You ever been angry? You ever heard the expression, misery loves company? Yeah. Sometimes as dads. When we're angry, we're going to make other folks angry too. All right? To anger alongside. So that, that word uh, provoke and the word wrath is the same Greek word. It's repeated twice. You've got double emphasis there. To anger alongside. And again, boys, is this a do or a don't? Don't. don't right? Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. To anger alongside. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Is that a do or a don't? A do, all right. So we've got the negatives that we're avoiding. Well, here's the positive. This is where we get our vision from. What is the positive? Do. Sometimes we read over that word bring. That's important. That is a verb, so it's something you do. It's in the present tense, so it's something you do now. And the mood is imperative, so it's a command. So what is it? Bring up. Bring it up are the same word, by the way. Again, duplicated. It means to rear to maturity. Right? I teach if you got on to us for... You raise hogs, you rear children. <laughs> rear, I, I use them synonymously. It's raise up. The goal is to take something that small and grow it to maturity. All right, but it doesn't just stop there. I mean, there's as a, as a practical sense, everyone who has children, we know and recognize they should care for the child, their physical needs, the food, the clothing, the shelter, and they should love them. And when people don't, we are what? upset because by nature you should do that and so when people don't do it it's offensive so Christians your duty is beyond that that's bare minimum so we're talking about going beyond the bare minimum are they clothed are they fed are they loved yeah okay that's good but it says bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord we're raising them to maturity but it's in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What's your emphasis on that? The Lord. All right, so what's, what's the nurture? The nurture, if you look at that word, it's tutorage. Ever heard of a tutor? All right, what's a tutor's job? Teach, right? To teach, to educate. Implied within that word is also disciplinary correction, right? What is your view of discipline? Is it to punish and squish like a bug for inconveniencing you? Or is it to train? Right? Disciplinary correction. You know the word disciple and discipline? Right? It's teaching, right? To learn. So as we discipline as parents, the goal is to teach. To teach what? To teach them to grow up, to be mature in the Lord. That's our motivation. Are we to discipline? Yeah, absolutely. But it's not for our convenience sake, because you push my buttons one too far and now you're gonna get it. No, it's I am training. Right? So I'm nurturing, I'm teaching and correcting 
in the Lord and admonishing, admonition. Literally means calling attention to, but it has the idea of a gentle or mild rebuke or correction or warning. I've used this expression before. As gentle as possible, and as firm as necessary. All right? So you're teaching, and that's kind of a positive thing, right? We're teaching the positives. Here's the things you do, and the admonition is I'm calling attention to these are the don'ts, right? The do's and the don'ts, right, kids? But again, what's the emphasis of both of them? Doing the things of the Lord and the things that you don't do because it doesn't please the Lord, all right? So again, to the, the basics of providing your physical needs and, and love, that's a given. We're going beyond that. As a Christian parent, to train our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is bigger than that. We want to train them to be mature, responsible, knowledgeable, godly men and women. So it is fine for you to lay your head down at night and pray, Lord, please keep my children close to you. Lord, please let them grow up to be godly men, to serve you or godly women, um, uh, serving you from the heart all the days of their life. It's fine to pray that. What are you doing now in anticipation of him answering that prayer? I understand God has to change our children's hearts. You don't have that ability. I don't have that ability. That's on him to give them the new birth and the Holy Spirit to serve Him from the heart. But are you going forward anticipating that He will? Or are you just praying, Lord, you deal with it. <laughs> you have a command to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We cannot shirk our responsibility of training of what does it look like to be a godly man and woman, a mature godly man and woman. Right? That's training them in the knowledge of the Lord. And it's not just with our mouths. It's modeling it. The vast majority of what you remember being taught from your parents, was it the conversations or was it how they acted? Right? Right. How do I know Mama loves Daddy? It's not because Daddy told me so. It's I saw Him loving her day in and day out. How do I know how to give forgiveness? Because I saw Daddy apologize. Acknowledge when he's wrong, right? We model what we want them to see. So if we're supposed to train them up in the knowledge of the Lord, right? Guess what we have to have? Knowledge of the Lord, right? So there's an imperative for us to be mature ourselves. Do we all have room to grow? Yes. Yes, all right? So is there room to be lazy? Nope. Me neither, all right? You know what's been really good about this study this week? It's highlighted to me all the areas where I've got to do better. All right, so I'm not just up here going, oh, me too. All right? We need to be training and preparing our children so that when the Lord does a work in them, they have the skills and tools ready to hit the ground running, to serve Him from the heart, not be... All right, I'm an adult, and I don't know how to serve. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it means to be a godly man or woman. Right? What a disservice. Okay? All right. So what's your vision? In your designing how you're going to respond to disciplinary issues or teaching or instruction, you and your spouse... Husbands, fathers, wives should be having the same vision. Our vision is to raise up godly men and women, to equip them to serve the Lord so that they're ready to lead their own families and ready to train up the next generations. Right? So parents, as a, as a Christian, what is your primary role? I'll give you a hint. It's not just the provider. That's a given. It's teachers. It's teaching. That's what this nurturing and the admonition of the Lord is. Teaching. Verbally, non-verbally, modeling, correcting when we stray for the purpose of learning again. I love you enough to teach you what is right. To draw those lines. I love you enough to model what is right. Okay? 
So again, nurture, it's, it's, it's teaching. Teaching what's right. Admonition, those gentle rebukes, gentle as possible, but as firm as necessary, right? There's, there's a different standard between the two-year-old and the 14-year-old, right? Different ways to get attention and to drive the lesson home, right? The goal is not chastisement for chastisement's sake, or to blow off steam as a parent, but what will teach this individual child at this individual moment what they've done is not pleasing to the Lord. That's the goal. Okay? So, do's and don'ts, boys. Practical. If I'm going to be teaching as a father, there's some things I need to be doing. Alright? Just, I'm going to give you a little laundry list. Do have regular family devotions. And dad, you need to lead them. This ain't mama's job. Mom can reinforce and she can support uh, when you're at work. But guys, this is our responsibility. We're the leaders. Who are both of these verses addressed to? Fathers, right? We've got the unique role of being the head of the household, the, the leader. With it comes responsibility, all right? Regular family devotions. Praying together as a family and with individual children. Got one, that's pretty easy. Get more than one. Praying with them individually, right? They're modeling. You're modeling to them what it looks and sounds like to pray, and you're teaching them because they'll be praying too. You're giving them those opportunities. Again, the goal is to raise them up, to not do everything for them, but to give them opportunities in each of these areas, right? How about singing together? Well, I don't sing too good. Eh. Is there admonitions in the scripture to sing? Yeah, sing. Croak if you got to, but sing. All right? Elizabeth knows these little children's songs. And she's learning a lot more than you give her credit for just because it has a little tune. But if I'm sitting over here like this and I'm too cool to look silly, you think she's going to do that for very long? No. We had a great moment uh, last week. As we're doing family time, and sometimes I fall into that thing where I just I don't, I don't, I don't really feel like singing right now. And, and you know what happens? And that one doesn't feel like singing, and that one doesn't feel like singing, and that one doesn't feel like singing. And David's the only one who's got the ability to just <laughs> let it go, right? But my attitude affects the older ones because they're looking at cues at me. But the opposite was happening last week where I had a whole slew of boys just singing and laughing and cutting up because there was a little girl who was having fun with it. And the joy was just permeating around the room. But it took us sitting down and intentionally making time to talk about the Lord and sing about the Lord and put it at a level for those that we're trying to teach. Okay? So, family devotions, praying together, singing together. Um, how about demonstrating personal devotion? Right? It's one thing to go, go to your room, do your Bible time, part of your homeschool curriculum, right? But they never see you reading your Bible. Right? And I'm not saying make a show of it, but it should be known in your household that that's important to you because it should be important to you. Right? How can I expect to train someone that being in God's Word is important and good for me and it's part of my daily... It's something that is... This is the only book in the world that is so important that you should read it every day of your life. There's nothing else like it. Right? But will they get that sense, will they get that understanding of your prioritization of your time if you don't? No. You're teaching. You're teaching that it's not that important, or it's important for others, but not for me. And if it's not important enough for Daddy, then maybe it's not important enough for, for me either. Okay? Same thing with church, right? We prioritize church. Fathers, that's what we can do. We can prioritize church. Because every time you don't, you're teaching that well, maybe a ball game is more important than serving God. Or an extra work shift. Or grass. Or sleeping in. Or, or whatever. Vacation. Whatever. Insert the blank here. Whatever you decide is more important than going to church. Right? Take a vacation. Fine. But go to church while you're there. Not, right? Serving God should not be optional in your family. And dads, you set the tone. Right? You can draw the line. You've got that authority. Right? Of that we will. Because when you choose not to, you've taught something. And one deviation 
can wipe out a whole pattern of consistency. Right? You've created an exception. Right? So we have to be very conscious about what lessons are we teaching. And y'all may be sitting there thinking, we're not dads yet. Learn this now. Right? One day, Lord willing, you will be dads. And it may help you understand a little bit about why I make the decisions I do. I'm answerable to God for how I've trained you. Okay? One other thing. Again, these are some practical do's. Um, how often do you speak about God and Christ outside of the church? What is your personal conversation like? If, if politics or Wall Street or work are the conversations that dominate 99% of your conversation, what are your children going to pick up on? Those are the more important things. All right? I was blessed the other day to have an alternator fail. Got to go uh, to the shop and um, replaced it. And a young man wound up driving me and two boys back over to the church. And you could tell that the young man wanted to talk. He found out I was pastor. And, and so we talked. We sat out there in his little pickup truck in front of my pickup truck, which needed a new battery. It was all just a fun story. But we talked for like 30 minutes about the Lord. And Patrick ran home afterwards and told his mom, Dad had a really good conversation with this young man. Right? How would he know that's a really good conversation? Right? If talking about God is not a priority for you and, and sharing it with other people is not a priority for you, then it's more likely to be sitting in the back seat thinking, when can we get out of this silly truck? Will they stop yammering? This is worthless. Right? So that was encouraging to me that he's recognizing the value of talking about the Lord. Right? And they were both quiet. I mean, I had two little boys <laughs> stuck in the back of I mean, they were little captain seats. It was, it was, it was tight. But they were very patient um, while I was having a needful conversation with this young man. So it was, it was good, but that doesn't just happen overnight, right? They look at our pattern of behavior. And so what we say, what we do, where we go matters just as much as what we're telling, right? And the other thing is um, looking for teachable moments, okay? How can you introduce from wherever you're at a biblical concept, a biblical topic. Um, you know, brother, boys and I went to Brother Frank's the other day and went fishing. Had a good time. Got six fish. Ellie got them cleaned up and they're in the freezer. Um, but as we were drove, driving to Shoal Creek yesterday, I was thinking about, okay, how can I use, what's a conversation we can start with them so we're not just having three hours of wasted time? And so I asked him, all right, boys, y'all you know, think about the Bible. Tell me the times when, when fish come up. Fish or fishing, it, it comes up a lot. And it led to about a 30-minute conversation. And they're having to think about um, different times throughout the Bible. And they're reminding each other of different stories. And so it was, was that a big deal? Did that take a lot of preparation? Right? Now it took a lot over the past few years of where we're introducing to those things in the front end. But as far as, I'm just looking for a way to talk to them. So what's something relevant going on? But it's looking for teachable moments where you can be directing things back to more profitable conversations. All right, so bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, those are a lot of do's. I wanted some do's because our verse in Colossians was a what? It was a don't. <laughs> uh, don't provoke them to anger. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. Again, this, this provoking was to stir, to stir to anger, right? So what are some things uh, that provoke your children to anger? And I use my children as a focus group um, as we're driving up there of trying to figure out, okay, guys, what, where have I failed you? Where are the times that left you frustrated, angry, uh, and discouraged? And so they gave me some good feedback. Um, and so we'll, we'll share that in a minute. But I'm going to give you, I'll start with one, some don'ts. Don't be absent. Okay. Don't be absent. Your lack of physical presence, whether an overemphasis on work or hobbies or fill in the blank, is discouraging. When you're there, be engaged. 
What am I teaching right now? I'm teaching that this thing in my hand is more important than talking to you, to looking you in the eye, to answering your question. Or this thing, or this thing, or whatever, right? Books, TVs, your, your distraction of choice is not more important than being engaged with your children. All right, so let's, let's take a hypothetical. Let's say uh, your little child is in public school and he has a second grade teacher, and you find out the second grade teacher shows up about twice a week, and when she's there, she's on her phone, and she kind of reads for 30 seconds to the child, um, and that's really all she does for the whole day. And you are livid. That is not a good teacher, right? She does not care about her job very much. How about us as fathers? How much are we present? How much are we engaged? If our primary role as a Christian father is a teacher, do we care about it very much if we're not thinking about it when we're there, right? Yeah, we can always get that extra shift, but what cost? Right? Are we teaching that having more stuff is more important? Or are we teaching contentment and learning to do with less? Right? There's, there's always a balance, and I'm not, not trying to dictate to anybody to make those decisions for you, but I want you to be thinking about that, of that there is an actual tangible cost to selling more of your time to someone else to get money because the cost is borne by our children. Right? They cannot. You cannot be replaced. Right? God has given you children to raise, to be in front of them and to teach them, and remote learning doesn't work too well in this scenario. All right? So be present, and that's positive, and be engaged. Um, you'd be amazed at the number of kids, if you talk to them, whose parents travel all the time or who aren't there connected with them who get discouraged right i don't really feel like mom and daddy really care about me or love me right that shouldn't be how our children feel right that's something that we're doing we're making choices and choosing to be absent right? so when we factor in how are we going to govern our life being present in our children's life is very 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 important we're the primary teachers. Teachers have to be on site. Okay? And when you're there, be intentional about it. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, so don't be absent. All right, so that's your first general rule. Don't be absent in mind when you're, not, when you're physically there or in body. Right? Be present. What's another way that we can discourage our children or stir them to anger? Our mouths. Right? Go back to Ephesians for a moment. I often make my children um, learn Ephesians 4.29. Ready, boys? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Do you know how that verse did not start? It did not start. Children! <laughs> Let no corrupt communication out of your, come out and go. It's addressed to us all. Right, that's right. So, corrupt communication, things that decay, that's ruin. Imagine if you've got skunk spray coming out of your mouth, right? It stinks, it's hard to get off, it's got long lasting effects. We were at Shoal Creek and they had a family of skunks underneath it. They're struggling, they, they've killed a few of them, hopefully, they got it taken care of. But, yeah, um, but that has a lingering effect, does it not? I want you to think about that when you're saying something you ought not, that that's like skunk spray coming out your mouth. Okay, that's your corrupt communication. But instead, that which is good to the use of edifying. What's it mean to edify? Build up. Build up, all right? So examples of corrupt communication, well, obviously there's, there's cursing, right? As fathers... Cursing, profanity, coarse words. None of that's profitable. That's just like hosing down your family with skunk spray and expecting things to get better. All right? How about um, biting sharp remarks? Right? You ever been just kind of short-tempered and you barked? Right? That was what some of the feedback I got from my children is that I, I, I barked at them and they had done something and I barked about it. And the example that was given happened more than a year ago. Right? 
So we don't know how long that skunk spray can linger, right? Hurting our children by being inconsiderate with our words. So biting sharp words. How about, how about insulting or cutting humor? Mocking. I'm just having fun with you. It's not fun to be on the receiving end. Right? Belittling. Right? All this is examples of corrupt communication. None of this builds up your child and focuses on your vision of raising them to be a mature, godly man and woman, ready to train the next generation. Right? So thoughtless and, and hurtful words can cause your children to be provoked to anger, to stir it to anger, right? And lead them to be discouraged. Now, let me make a note here. That does not mean that every time you address your child, it will be, oh, thou sweetest thing. <laughs> right? There are a time to speak sternly. Right? You have a call to rebuke and correct. Right? And so, children, this verse is not a weapon for you. Well, Dad, you're provoking me to anger, so you better not be doing that. No, I told you to clean your room. I have that right, and you must obey whether it makes you angry or not. Right? The idea is that when my behavior is wrong, my motivation, my attitude is wrong, and that's leading to anger, not I'm giving you an instruction that you don't want to do. All right? So this is not a club for children. This is an admonition to parents to govern how we control ourselves. Sometimes we will have to speak to you sternly. But the motivation for, for that should be, again, I'm teaching what is right. As gentle as possible, but as firm as necessary to make sure you got the point. Okay? All right. So our words, but thoughtless and hurtful words can be really discouraging. Um, other verbalized things. We've got unreasonable commands. Right? Parents, sometimes we're unreasonable. Right? And we get upset. Well, why didn't you do that thing I didn't tell you to do? Well, I forgot to tell you, but I expected you to do it anyway. Is that reasonable? No. Right? Or how about if the standard shifts? Right? On one day, this is okay, but on the next day, no, it's got to be over there. Is that discouraging? Not knowing what is the line? Yeah. We got, we, our inconsistency of verbalizing standards and holding them to standards can be really upsetting. Right? If your boss did that to you, Okay, on this day, here's your line, stay here. And you do exactly that, and then they jump down your throat because you didn't maintain this line that they said over here that no one ever mentioned. Man, you get, you get bent out of shape. Right? That's, that's, that's a reasonable thing to get upset about. And so we need to make sure that what we're, we're drawing our lines are, whatever they are, are consistent and reasonable. Um, what other things are words? How about just passionate exclamations? Right? Y'all ever hit your thumb with a hammer? You ever had somebody come and ask you a question after you hit your thumb with a hammer? <laughs> Sometimes we're a little shorter with our answers than we ought to be, right? Just you, you've got something building up and you use that as an outlet, right? I have demonstrated to my children that I lack self-control when I do that, right? Self-control is, is important. And if I expect them as little people with, you know, immature bodies, minds, and hearts to maintain self-control, what should I do? Model it. <laughs> and when I don't, I should admit it. Right? Some of the best teaching we can do is acknowledging I was wrong. Anybody here capable of being wrong? Me too. Right? But it, learned, it, it shows a real lesson when we've got the humility to say, I was wrong. I handled that wrong. Acknowledging and apologizing for it, one, teaches people how to do that. Right? You ever, well, my dad never admitted he was wrong all the days of his life. Well, he's taught you a lesson there. He hasn't shown you how to be wrong. Because guess what, humans? You're going to be wrong at some point. If you haven't been wrong yet, well, you were. <laughs> But learning how to apologize, but also taking that opportunity, this is what I should have done instead. So not only are you acknowledging the error, but then you're taking it, here's how I should have handled it. And guess who that also is teaching and reinforcing to you? <laughs> Yourself, right? 
All right. Um, if you want a biblical example, you can look at Saul and his interaction with Jonathan. Um, Jonathan was trying to figure out if Daddy was really trying to kill David, right? And he was testing the waters, and Saul got bent out of shape. And Saul started lashing out at Jonathan. He said some pretty vile things, not just about Jonathan, but Jonathan's mama. Right, you go read it, First, First Samuel 20 and around verse 30. I'm not even going to go there. But that, that contentious and reproachful, insulting language, does that help raise our children up to be mature, functional Christians? Ready to serve? No! That's tearing them down. That's that corrupt communication. That's what we want to, to avoid. Another thing to avoid is the nevers and always. Well, you never clean your room, or well, you're always disrespectful. Guess what's almost always true? You're lying. A hundred percent failure rate is really rare. And if they've ever completed, if they've ever cleaned their room once, then you've just told a whopper. All right? You have painted with a broad brush of generalization that they know is not true, and that you know is not true. And guess what? You've now made them defensive because you know it's not true, and they know it's not true. But you're painting them with a brush that's worse than they actually are. Are defensive people easy to teach? No, me neither. Right? It's unjust. You're falsely accusing me. Now, I may not clean it very often, but if I've cleaned it once, then it's not a never. It's not an always. And same thing for spouses. Don't talk to spouses about always and nevers. What you're doing is you're bringing up your list of wrongs that you've been keeping over here in the corner ready to hammer at them. <laughs> Let those go. That's not love, right? Go read, go read 1 Corinthians 13 about not keeping the records of wrongs. Right? Let those go. Teach at this moment. What is the issue at this moment? Not the whole pattern of behavior since they've existed, but what is this moment? Specific issues can be corrected without attacking the human. All right? All right. So our words. Our words can cause anger and cause discouragement. What they should be used is to build... Right? And to train. Positive. That's what we should be doing. Not to tear down and to you know, inflame anger. That's another visual. Imagine you got your fan going on the billows, right? That's like stirring up your children to anger. Right? We want to build up and teach, not tear down and inflame their personal anger. Alright? So, our absence can discourage, our words can discourage, and that kind of leaves one other category. Our deeds. Right? Things we do, or sometimes don't do. And so in this, I'm going to challenge you that our deed of our lack of follow-through is probably the most discouraging, at least in my life, or failure as a father, is lack of follow-through. Um, that's discouraging. When my actions don't match up to what I say. Now, that could be in something I've taught. It's important to control your anger. Hey, stop that! My actions didn't match up to my words, and so I've, I've taught an inconsistent lesson. Well, what you say is good for me, but not for you. I smell a hypocrite, right? I play, I, you're playing a part, right? That's discouraging, right? The other thing that probably is more problematic for me is promises or statements that aren't kept, right? Yeah, we'll go fishing at Brother Frank's, and then something comes up. And then something comes up. And then something comes up. Right? If I've said I'm going to do it, I need to do it. Now, part of this gets into training our mouths not to make promises and to say we will try, we will shoot for, we will, and giving some kind of language that I want to. There are other things that are more important than this particular activity that may come up. Right? Being honest with them and so that they can understand the decision promises. But if you make a promise and you've overcommitted yourself, if you don't follow through, you've broken their trust. So we've got to be very careful about what we open our mouth and commit to. And my children may not have picked up on that, but often my language will we'll try. We'll shoot for it. I'd like to it. And that's my way of trying not to break trust. Right? I want them to trust what I say. I want my words that come out of my mouth to them know that to the best of my knowledge and ability that they're true. Right? 
how can they trust me to teach them about a God they can't see if they see me lying about things that they can see? Okay? I want them to trust me. Now, that doesn't mean that sometimes we won't be able to do it and they'll be disappointed or whatever, but if I haven't made that a blanket, you know, a promise that we're going to do this, then even though they're disappointed, it's disappointed because it didn't follow through, not because Daddy lied to me. Okay? Um, so our lack of follow through. That could also be true. Um, well, let's, let's, let's shift gears here a little. Um, a disciplinary regime or deeds. A disciplinary scheme or system or however you're approaching it that's inconsistent among siblings is problematic. Right? Jacob had his favorite son, right? He wound up getting thrown in a pit and his coat all torn up, right? Jacob was not right in that. Okay? If you and you commit the same crime and I let one off scot-free and I bring the hammer down on the other, the one who's had the hammer down is going to be angry and upset because they have been treated unjustly. Right? Micah 6 eight. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with it. We should be just in our commands, in our discipline, in our approaches. That we should not bear favoritism. And sometimes that shows itself in just laziness, right? The inconsistent responses because I felt like dealing with it then and now I don't. And so then we've got a, muck, mur a murky line with a child of, well, where is it? What am I allowed to do? What am I not? And if it really just depends on your mood, that'll be frustrating. That'll be discouraging. Another thing is if we we over discipline when the punishment doesn't fit the crime. All right, so here's your hypothetical. Um, you come home from work and the front window's broken. You don't ask any questions, you line them up and you start disciplining, right? Now, is there a difference in the scenario between your child has their bat and their ball, they're walking out to go play, they trip, the ball flies out of their hand and it goes through the window. I would classify that as an accident. Versus they're playing in the front yard, 100 yards away, they hit a foul ball, it goes straight back 100 yards and breaks the window. I'd say that was negligent. Versus they're playing ball, but they're playing right in front of the window. <laughs> like five feet away. He misses, goes right through the window. I'd say that's reckless. I'm getting legal standards here. And versus... <laughs> The last little kid who's just mad because he got struck out, he takes the ball and he chunks it through the window. That's intentional. <laughs> Accident, negligent, reckless, intentional. Dad, the same result happened. There's a window broken. It's going to cost you the same amount to get it fixed. You're upset because you weren't planning on it and now you got to deal with it and you got a hundred other things to deal with and you're tired. Do you take the time to figure out what happened? and to train accordingly. What lesson can you train the child who tripped? He's walking to go play outside. You going to train him, don't trip? <laughs> the best thing you can probably teach him there is showing compassion and mercy. Because the little fella's probably tore up and upset. And daddy's going to come down on me and jump down my throat when there's really nothing he could have done. You know, Don't walk through the house? <laughs> Versus what can you train with someone who is playing 100 yards away and the ball went, well, maybe let's shift the direction. Maybe make it 200 yards, right? There's something where you can think of, okay, you are trying, but we didn't go quite far enough, right? Thinking about others, thinking about property, planning ahead. Versus the kid who's reckless of, you knew better. What were you, what were you thinking? Well, you weren't thinking. And so we've got a cause and effect conversation that goes on. And, and I would say that there's more culpability for that kid. That kid probably needs to pay for the window, right? Versus little Bubba who did it on purpose, right? You've got multiple issues there. You've got whatever anger is precipitating it, how you're responding to events that don't go your way, how you're lashing out. This is, this is a big deal. And this is one that's probably worth quite a bit of time 
and effort and conversation and scripture and prayer and like this is this is five alarm fire to me of that there is a problem here that needs to be addressed because we've got to train right because this is going the exact opposite of where we need to right but guess what all that takes time and patience because if you just look at the broken window and you're figuring up the cost and the time and the inconvenience and you feel the blood pressure in your neck and the thing sticking out on your forehead it may be time to go in your room and calm down for about five minutes before you come out and start the investigation right but again it's executing your vision what is my purpose here is it to condemn the broken window and, and make sure the punishment you know the, the the one who's guilty is i'm not advocating for children's violence or whatever I'm just, I'm, it's not to condemn anybody the purpose is training right? and how we train if we're consistent and we're loving and our approach is to try to raise them up to be god the men and women then that will be a very different look and appearance and feel that I'm just flying by the seat of my pants and I'm just trying to survive and I'm just trying to react to this particular moment right and we've lost the vision of what are we doing long term right um, my children know that often you know disciplinary sessions or whatever that is whether that's having to write out a particular scripture or whether it's a spanking or whatever there's often a discussion that conversation that a conversation that's included with it if you ask Patrick he'd say that's the more painful portion right? <laughs> and the bigger deal it is the longer it takes and the slower it is because there's more that needs to be taught and reinforced um, and not making it just a one and done and you know now we're, we're, we're done with this but continuing to follow up on that that takes time and effort and no small of self-reflection of am I handling this in the way that's best and spouses we got to check each other right because it's easy to see when your spouse is wrapped up in their emotion my wife can see what I am and I can see when she is and sometimes that's a time of pause let me help here you calm down you can come finish up later but I mean that's that's part of that protecting the kid of, of Whatever lesson you're going to teach here is probably not going to be the right one. Right? Okay. Alright, so. Let's look at our text just one more time. Reinforce this. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged. So fathers, provoke not. What are some things that provoke? Your absence, whether it's in body or in mind. Your words, thoughtless, cruel, insulting, deeds. You know, again, look at it. Saul. Saul is just a terrible example there. He chunked a javelin at his son. He was ready to skewer him to the wall. That should be bare minimum. No, no, no physical harm or injury. Um, but being consistent in our deeds of how we treat them and what we're trying to teach so that they can trust what we say. That they can understand from a pattern of behavior time after time after time that I should be able to trust that daddy's going to do the absolute best he can to follow through on whatever he said. And that when he's disciplining me, he's disciplining me because he loves me. And fathers, who's our pattern for that? God, the Father, right? You can go to Hebrews 12 if you want. Yeah, let's do it. You got a minute? Hebrews uh, 12 reminds us in 5, um, You've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. 
but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now the whole context of this is if, if the Lord's chasing you in your life, be encouraged. It stinks to go through, but that's a sign that he loves you. Good. But this here, of we're the fathers there, it says we're chasing them after our own pleasure. That's not the great standard. The great standard is how is our Heavenly Father chasing us? It's for our profit, for our good, for our building up. Why? That we might be partakers of His holiness, right? What's our vision? Raising up mature, godly women and men so that they can be partakers of the holiness. Knowing what godliness looks like and sounds like and acts like, right? That should be the motivation that each of our chastening for our children should be for their profit, for their building up, for that training. That's 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 the regime. That's the purpose. Um, is that easy? No. <laughs> Are you commanded to do it? Yeah, absolutely. Do we need to learn how to do it better? Yeah, and then what we learn, we need to do what? Practice it. <laughs> right? Apply it. So we are we're bringing them up, right? Raising to maturity, rearing to maturity in the nurture, in the tutorage, in the, in the education, and admonition, those gentle rebukes. But again, the focus of all that is of the Lord. Right? Yep, you care for their basic needs, care for their, their clothing and all that, that's, that's fine, that's good, do that. Love them, yeah, do that. But beyond that, be the teacher that they need. No one can replace you. This is a unique job. Right? You can't pawn it off on me. I'm only with you a few hours a week. Train them so that once the Lord does that work in their life, they are so farther down the road, ready to know and understand more about Him from the heart level where you can teach the head. Hard job. Worthy of our time. Worthy of our effort. Worthy of our practice. Kids, we do it because we love you. And because we're trying to please the Lord. Right? This is part of the role that He's put us into. This is us trying to fulfill that role in a way that would please Him. So, thank you all.